Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Larry Sharp. He is a gubernatorial candidate in New York, and he is running through the Libertarian Party. So, Larry, thank you so much for coming on. I am happy to be here. I appreciate you having me on. So you have run into a situation uh, similar to Matthew Ho. Uh, from what I understand, you have run uh, for governor before uh, in New York. Same thing through the Libertarian Party. But this time around now, they're telling you that you can't be on the ballot. Can you explain to everyone what is going on? Absolutely. And people think constantly the idea that, well, you know what, it's only, you know, these types of people or, the, or whatever throw people off the ballot. No, it's Democrats and Republicans. On some things, they agree completely. So in 2018, I ran and in New York State, it's a very odd state in that the only way you can become a party in New York State is if your governor candidate only gets 50,000 votes on the governor line. So literally, we could win a senator, we could win anything, doesn't matter. That is the only way. That's very that's very unique. Most states, it's a percentage of the vote or something like that. I was just governor. And to get on the ballot in the first place, to be uh, available on the ballot, you had to get 15,000 signatures, which wasn't crazy. We did it. We did, we did it in 2018. We did it. We got through it. I got my 50,000 votes, and I became uh, uh, an official party in New York State. Life was good. And then two years later, the Democrats decided, you know what? We were just kidding. Um, we're going to change all the rules and make it to where you remove from the ballot and you have no chance. So I said, wow, that is very hard. And then they said, you know what? If you want to get back on the ballot, I know we said 15,000. We're going to triple it to 45,000 signatures and only give you six weeks and move it earlier into the spring to where in New York State, we still have snowstorms. So that's what they did. So now they made it where it's virtually impossible. And of course, we sued them saying, this is impossible. There's This cannot be done. It is impossible. And they said, no, anyone can do it. It's easy. Not understanding that for this to happen, we would have to average 10,000 signatures per week with a week to prepare everything. That's 2,000 signatures per day if you work people five days a week. 10 hours a day, by the way. If you did 10 hours a day, five days a week. The average person who is very super good at it will maybe get 50 to 100 signatures, but the average worker will only get about 25 signatures per day. So I need 40 people to work five weeks, five days a week, 10 hours a day, only wealthy people could possibly do that. No one else will have that kind of group. And to be clear, when it was over, we sued again saying, look, no one made it. We had a guy worth about $50 million. He couldn't make it. We had a sitting congressman. He couldn't make it. Nobody made it. So my argument to the court was, look, this is, this is Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board of Education. They said separate but equal was going to be equal. Then we found out it wasn't equal. So then we changed the laws. You said anybody could do this. Well, now I'm showing you, nobody can do this. Literally a sitting congressman couldn't do it. And a guy worth $50 million couldn't do it. No one did it. Literally, this is the first time in 80 years in New York State that there will not be an independent governor candidate on the ballot. First time in 80 years. So there's no independent candidate on the ballot. So even with that, I lost my lawsuit. Everyone else quit. The other guys were like, we're not going to do this. We're done. We're quitting. Not me. I'm still going. So I actually am going to be doing it again. Um, and I have another lawsuit that hopefully I will win here September 9th. But this time, the funny part is I'm back by the Libertarian Party and also the Forward Party. And the reason why I have both endorsements is because the Forward Party understands the same thing that I do, which is without third parties, we're doomed. You may not like the Forward Party. You may not like the Libertarian Party. You may not like the Green Party. I mean, Howie Hawkins is my friend. We're both fellow Marines. Um, well, you may not like those parties. One of those may be your better party. But if there's none of them, we are finished. Because mm -hmm. now it's just a left-right paradigm. And in my state, I'm not sure any other people who are listening or watching, in my state, their campaigns are this, other guy bad. That's the campaign. They're not talking about how to solve problems, solve anything, nothing. They're just going, you have to vote for me because the other person's terrible. That is their campaign. With a third party, that changes, right? I have an answer for co-ops. I have an answer for the MTA. You may disagree with my answers, but at least now you have to come up with an answer, challenge me, have a real policy, not just go, well, I'm not a Democrat or I'm not a Republican. So I think that's right. the key issue. So once I got on the, once I tried to get on the ballot the first time, I won the first time to get on the ballot, 
then the conservatives and the Republican Party sued me to throw me off the ballot. So I was off the ballot, on the ballot, on the ballot. Now I'm off the ballot. Now I'm hoping now I will actually be on the ballot September 9th. So this goes to show everyone it's not just the Democratic Party that pulls third party candidates off the ballot. The Republican Party also does this as well. I I have to ask a question about the redistricting because I have seen this has been an issue in New York. They're changing the districts. Uh, It's causing a lot of confusion for people, especially those that were candidates, also for voters Mm -hmm. as well. Why do you believe they're doing this? The reality of it is um, where the, the problem we have in New York State is that the the courts just support the state. They don't support the people constantly. You see it all the time. So the courts just go, oh, if they said it, I guess it's good. And that has been a problem consistently. So thinking that the Democratic Party, once we had the redistrict, thought, oh, we can gerrymander even worse. Gerrymandering in New York is as bad as all the rest of the states. I mean, they're all terrible. And the Supreme Court dropped the ball not ending gerrymandering. That was a terrible decision, but they did. So now gerrymandering is still okay. One of the reasons why I'm for open primaries is because you have gerrymandering, right? In certain districts, why bother running? I mean, we probably know this. Right. Half of the districts running, there's no one else running. It's one person because it's so gerrymandered. Literally in my state, my governor at the time was Cuomo when we were running um, our mayoral candidates. And Cuomo said out loud, he goes, hey, we're going to have an election here in June to figure out who's the mayor of New York. Now, the election's in November. So why did he say June? Because the primary is in June. He knows that whoever wins the primary wins the election because it's so right. gerrymandered, right? So that's what we have. So with that in mind, the Democrats thought, oh, we can now gerrymander our district so much so we can throw a bunch of Republicans out of, of Congress by gerrymandering it perfectly to remove um, Republicans from these, these districts. A judge finally said, wow, this is so bad, I can't even accept it. And when that happened, they had someone neutral redistrict again. And by the way, that happened in the middle of my uh, of me getting signatures. So the district shifted while I was getting signatures. And the law says I have to get at least 500 signatures from each from half of the congressional districts. There were no congressional districts. Why? Because New York State lost the congressman. So many people leave New York State. We went from 27 to 26. So when the old from the when the new districts were kicked out, You can't go back to the old ones. There's too many districts. So New York State for several weeks literally had no congressional districts. And that was while I was signing. That's how bad it is. So finally, someone neutral said, here's the districts. And when that popped up, that was in the middle of primaries. So we had to move the primaries. So we just had primaries last week. And then another one, but we've had three or four primaries this this year in New York. It has been a total disaster. So I, I know that didn't sound great, but that's what happened in my state. Yeah, it's been an absolute mess. I have to get your opinion. I'm curious also about the mayor race that happened in New York City. Why do you feel that someone like Eric Adams won? Because for me, like when I was listening to like all the different candidate speeches, I was like, there's no way New Yorkers are going to vote for Eric Adams. No No, way you're going to vote for I knew he was going to win. Actually, I met Eric Adams probably four or five years ago at a real estate event. And I said to my friends there, he'll be next, he's next mayor. There was no doubt he was in the next man. I was 100% sure. And the reason is de Blasio, by everybody's measure, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter, was a very bad mayor, right? Everyone knows he was a very bad mayor. Democrats said that. How do we know that? He tried to run for city council and he couldn't even get 10% of the vote in the district he lives in. So his own people's own district didn't like him. What New Yorkers don't like is Republicans. They don't like Republicans at all. So if it's de Blasio against Republican, de Blasio wins, right? So de Blasio was a was a clearly bad mayor. So people wanted something the opposite. And de Blasio tried, at least his rhetoric was, I'm not sure if he actually was, but his rhetoric was very far left. He didn't always do left, but his rhetoric was far left, always. So New Yorkers heard that and said, we don't want far left. So they, 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 it was a rebound, if that makes any sense. And Eric Adams was the best rebound candidate when it came to de Blasio. I think I think Eric Adams is our mayor because of Bill de Blasio. That's what I believe. Well, my whole thing is, too, I feel like after everything that has happened with the NYPD in New York, especially after George Floyd, the way that they treated some of the protesters, I was just very shocked that people would want to vote for an ex-cop. Well, yes. And, And the reason why I say it again is I think de Blasio is the reason, right? They wanted the opposite. 
right? Kind of how you see, like you get you get Obama and then you get Trump, mm. right? You get you get a backlash, right? The pendulum swings. And I I'm not saying Eric Adams is Trump. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm just <laughs> uh, please be clear. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying you wind up getting that swing. So I think Eric Adams, when it came to the mainstream candidates, were the was the furthest right candidate in the Democratic field. And that's why I think he got it, because de Blasio's rhetoric was the furthest left. Am, am I making sense with this or no? I get it. it it's just I know like at one point, um, Andrew Yang, I thought, was was leading in yes. the polls. And then there was just this shift all of a sudden. Yes. Andrew, uh, Andrew Yang, and look, I like Yang. I was on stage with him recently this summer. Um, he's endorsed me. I'm happy and I'm happy he's endorsed me. The, the issue I think you have with most candidates who run third party is they don't understand how to run third party and they hire consultants that don't run third party. And when you are playing third party, the rules are different. When you are playing spoiler, the rules are different, right? And I don't think his team understood that well. They didn't understand that the rules are different. Whenever, whenever I go on any, when I go on any type of, of media, I'm treated differently because I'm third party. And if you're ever outside the mainstream system, there's different rules. I don't think his team knew that. Okay. And you guys, you do have ranked choice <clears throat> voting, correct? Only for the primary in New York City, which drives oh. me crazy because Democrats in New York City know that ranked choice voting is the best type of voting because it gives you the option of not only getting the far left or far right person. You have a chance of getting someone who's moderate if you want to. You also can have what's what I call offensive and defensive voting, right? So if you like someone, maybe you thought that, uh, you know, I know Maya was the, was the best person to run. You thought she was the best, but you, thought, you didn't know if she could win. So you vote for her first, and then whoever you like second. Well, if I don't want her, then I can take Yang. A saying that's what you thought. So you go Maya and Yang, and then you get an offensive vote and a defensive vote. That's a good thing. Democrats know that. They won't give it to the state, because if you give it to the state, there'll be a lot of people doing things like voting Howie Hawkins first, <laughs> right? And then the Democrat, right? They'll be doing that. And then all of a sudden, Howie Hawkins gets a bunch of votes. And they don't want that. They want to make sure that they all get off the ballot. We only keep mainstream Democrats, mainstream Republicans. And that's, and that's the reason why we don't do it outside of, uh, of New York City. But yes, only in New York City, only in the primaries. You don't get it in the, in the, uh, in the actual um, election. Yeah, we actually had that as a ballot initiative here in Massachusetts during uh, 2020, and it didn't mm -hmm. pass. And when I asked people, like, why they, like, voted against it, they said they didn't understand the question. And to be honest with you, had I not been, like, paying attention politically, yes. I probably would have been confused by the question, too. So I feel like that was done on purpose. So who 100%. knows if it'll come back again. But, but well, yeah. I talk a really lot about it. It's part of my platform. It's part of the forward party's platform, my platform. Many third parties want ranked choice voting. It's in Alaska now. I think Maine, it's on the ballot in Nevada. So it is growing and I think it is going to become the norm, which is the advantage, if it becomes the norm, you then can actually have an actual third party. You can have a multi-party democracy, right? Where you can create coalitions, right? Right now, you don't have to hear the people who aren't in the mainstream. You can just ignore them and you see it constantly, right? You see, it. there are a lot of people on the left who are talking to me because I actually have a plan for co-ops. You don't have that happening under Democrats. Democrats in my state don't care about that at all. So yeah. why? They don't have to. They can ignore it. It doesn't matter, right? They didn't show up. Half the Democrats didn't even show up when when um we were trying to unionize here in Queens and Amazon. Nobody said yep. a word. Democrats didn't even bother showing up. Why? They don't have to. But if you actually had a multi-party democracy, that would change everything. Mm. I have to get your you have to educate me and, and some of us as well. Uh, what exactly do libertarians believe? Because I've been saying this for a while. I wanted to talk to someone who is a libertarian. Mm -hmm. I like to have different voices on this show. Uh, what how do you feel, for example, let's look at the issue of health care. Sure. What, what is your opinion about health care for everyone in this country? Yeah, um, what most libertarians would agree, not all. We we, of course, also have our fringes, as every party does. Um, most libertarians are going to say this one important idea. You do you, right? That's the concept. The concept is you can be as liberal or as conservative as you want to be. Just don't force your view on others, that you should be getting people to change their minds through persuasion and not through coercion. And that tends to be a common theme throughout libertarianism. Now, some people go very far, some people don't. But if you understand that concept, that if you want to change people's minds through your works, your example, your community, we're okay with it. 
But without that, we tend to not be okay with it. So that's an overall concept that makes any sense. So now healthcare specifically. If you look right now at healthcare in America, there's becoming a two-tier system. I see it here in New York City. You probably see it there. The wealthy don't go to the wealthy doctors don't take insurance anymore. The best doctors are stopping to take insurance. And if you're on Medicare, Medicaid, you can't find a doctor. And if you're wealthy, you don't go to managed care. You don't do it. You go to private doctors, you write a check, or you swipe your credit card, or you're part of some system. And that's how people get healthcare who are wealthy right now. This is why what I want to do, and my plan, I have a plan literally on my website that talks about the idea of if you're on Medicare or Medicaid, either one, absolutely. The, the government tends to know about how much money you're going to spend every year. You're they have actuaries who know you're this age with this issue. You're probably going to spend a um, what about sake of argument, a thousand dollars a year on healthcare. I say put that on an actual card, like your EBT card or something else. Put it on a card. Go out there and use your healthcare as you see fit. Now you might go, Larry, what happens if if you get sick? It's okay. I'm not getting rid of Medicare, Medicare. You still have it. It's still there. If you have a catastrophic issue, it's still there. But I'm giving you the option of going to the same doctors the wealthy go to. When you start going to those doctors, what's going to wind up happening? Those doctors will see that and go, huh. So you can just swipe your card? Yeah. If you want to come to me, swipe the card, we're good. They'll start seeing that. They'll start marketing to that group of people. People start seeing that. More doctors will ship into that world and pricing will come down. I want pricing of the best doctors to come down. I don't want to reinforce a two-tier system where the working poor and middle class get whatever doctors are left over and the wealthy get the best doctors. So if you make that happen, it will shift. How do I know this, right? How, how do I know this to be true? Number one, because if you look at the secondary system of, of healthcare right now, meaning non-essentials, things like um, LASIK eye surgery, body enhancement, cosmetic dentistry, any of those things, you see any of those, in every case, the price has come down, accessibility has increased. There were already models right now trying to help people out. And I'll use the example, believe it or not, of computers. If you go back, say, 10 or 15 years, most computer repair shops were what's called break fix. That means if your computer breaks down, people come in and they pay you pay per hour, they fix your computer. It's in their best interest for your computer to be broken so they can get paid. Now it's not the case. Most people do some type of monthly fee and they fix your computer whenever they want, whenever you need it to be fixed. It's a common way. There's a company we've not called forward, not like the party, but called forward that's doing that now. You drop about 150 bucks per month, and you're able to go whenever you want. It's just like a, like a gym membership. Their goal is to make sure that you are taken care of. If you're healthy, you, you don't show up. That's good. Most private doctors like it when you just come in and swipe your card. But if you go to a doctor who takes insurance, here's what will happen every single time. Once you once the doctor takes insurance, you go to that place. Your appointment is at 2. You get seen at 345 because the doctor stocks three or four or five people up at the same time because many people cancel. Then when you show up, they see you for 10, 15 minutes. They always end it with one of three things, a procedure a prescription or a test. Why? That's how they get paid. So when people who are wealthy say, let's go Medicare for all, let's go Medicaid for all, let's go do that. When they say that, what they're saying is, you poors take those doctors, I'm going to keep my rich doctor. Good luck with that. They're okay with you having managed care. I'm not. I want a better system for everybody. I want everyone to have better care, but I'm not going to get rid of Medicaid and Medicare. If you have to fall back to it, you should, but I want you to be able to have better doctors. So I'm not wealthy and I want everyone to have Medicare for all. I know. Like I, I, I feel like when I look at other countries, like I lived in Germany for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've, I've lived in countries where everyone has health care and it, yep. it boggles my mind why we can't have that here in the United States. And I think it's because they want to they want the big pharma companies to benefit. A lot of these politicians have right. pharma companies as donors, Blue Cross Blue Shield, health insurance companies as donors. And that's really what, what they what they benefit. So why not just go to a Medicare for all system? System and you give can. everybody look temperature. you could do that if you want to let me tell you what's going to happen the, the reason why it, it, it hasn't worked well is because america has a bad history of this right america has tied its insurance companies to 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 actual jobs and wage labor that wasn't a good idea most of the countries haven't done that the germans began theirs in the 1880s i think 1880s they began healthcare for all it had nothing to do with companies the Germans have a better history of this. Our history is garbage. Our <laughs> history is terrible. So I'm not saying you're wrong in what we could have done in the past. If we can shift our culture into that, maybe, but that's not where we are. I'm trying to give you a realistic answer that will shift people into the right mindset. We cannot repair this system tomorrow. If you tomorrow said everybody gets 
Medicare for all tomorrow. Here's what would happen. Insurance companies would run it. There'd be Medicare supplements. That's what would happen. You're right. Pharma would win. That would happen. Most of the doctors who are decent would, would opt out of Medicare and then all go into private systems. How do I know that? It's happening now in New York City. That's literally happening right now. If you adjusted it without changing it, 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 what will happen is most people in America who are working poor and middle class will have health care insurance. That's true, but they will have secondary doctors, secondary care, and it's not going to work. Well, you've got to make changes to the actual culture before you can change that you want. Why do you think that you said most op doctors would opt out? Why do you think that? It's happening already because there's literally a there there is a job description right now, uh, a job I should say that people who their job is to collect money from doctors because insurance companies don't want to pay. They don't want to pay. So what's happening is now that they have to get people who will actually spend six, they make six figures so they can collect for doctors. Doctors are getting tired of that. That's why they keep opting out. They just keep opting out because like, I don't want to pay some guy to chase the insurance company to get paid. I don't want to deal with this issue. I'm out. If you're telling me you can make a cultural change in America, I'm open to the idea. Maybe it's a better plan. What I see now, if you did this automatically, immediately, the current system, the way it's set up with the pharma companies, it's not going to go well, is what I'm telling you. The wealthy aren't going to put up with this. They're going to go into their own world, take the best doctors. It's, you want to try, it's okay. I go to private doctors too, right? I, I do. So I'm trying to give my plan, whether you agree or not with it, is trying to get other people to have better choices and better options. If you go to Medicare for all right now, it is my opinion. And if I'm wrong, look, we're probably going to anyway. We're going to find out. It's fine. If if I'm wrong, then I'll be wrong. Awesome. Life is good. But I have a feeling I'm going to be right in this one. If we go to Medicare for all, you have a lot of people saying, what the hell is going on here? Um, I don't like this system at all. So let's talk about the New York Health Act, because this actually, at one point I was looking at this, I think it was last year, and I actually thought, I said, well, New York State is probably going to be the first state to get something like this passed because yeah. there was more talk about that. Yep. What what has happened with that? Because like I like last year I felt like there was a lot of buzz around yep. it. Now I don't hear much about it anymore. Um and from what I understand and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, even people who didn't live in New York, say they lived in New Jersey, but they worked in New York, they could also fall under the New York Health Act. The the problem to be full with you and it's going to make some your your audience just want to explode. It's too expensive. New York State has been losing population for 10 years. We actually lost a congressman recently. People are fleeing our state in droves. They're going to Florida. They're going all over the place. They're, they're physically leaving. Our budget has exploded from about 180 billion to 220 billion. And New York State doesn't have a Fed. So we can't just print money. We're literally in hundreds of billions of dollars of debt. Illinois is worse than us. Illinois will probably go under in the next five or 10 years it'll go under. Behind them, probably Kansas, they're in trouble too. And then maybe New York State too. They're all going to go under. So we we can't, the dollars are just not there for us anymore. We, we were able to do well uh, last time because we had huge bonuses from our financial industry that gave us tons of money from income. About 20 billion worth of those people have left our state in the past two years. So we won't be getting that money back. But that happened last time. And the federal government wrote us big checks. So that was able to help us out. After that, the cash isn't there for it. If we do it, we'll just go further and further into debt. But what I'm saying here is there's an answer. And the answer is, without question, finding a way of raising money without making uh, the tax burden any higher. You can do that by creating a fund. It's a New York State social trust, similar to what Norway does or similar to what Singapore does. Permanent capital right now is spending tons of money buying up land everywhere, buying up housing. It's one of the reasons, there were others, but one of the reasons why the housing markets exploded, why some people are renters, because permanent capital has spent so much time buying up all this land, raising the prices up and forcing everyone into into uh, rentership, people who don't want to rent. I mean, some people want to rent, no worries. But a lot of people who don't want to rent are forced into renting. Pull that money out, put it into a social trust. How do I know it will work? It's already working in other countries. Once that trust comes up from that money, we can begin to, to have that money to spend for other things. So they will happily put in for a yearly dividend, they'll get their money back, and we'll have cash to spend on other things that we want, social issues that we want to work on. This way we can support the people who need support without having to increase the tax base. The tax base is getting so high that many people are leaving. You ask most New Yorkers why they moved to Florida, 
at least six in 10 are going to tell them it's because of the high taxation. So let's keep people in New York, get the wealthy to pay without adding taxation. We can do it. There are ways of making it happen without taxation. Well, I would say New York has enough money to give the police. That's, they have, right. have money when it comes to that. You're not going to hear me fight you on that. I'm, I'm libertarian. I, <laughs> I, yep, I'm not fighting you on that one. Look, do you, you think I agree with the war on drugs? No. You think I agree with locking everybody up? No. Absolutely. No, I'm not at all. I'm not on board with that whatsoever. We agree. No problem on that one. Look, if freedom means the freedom to do what you want without hurting others, to include loving who you want to, to love, being with who you want to be with, putting whatever substance you choose appropriate into your body, all of those things, right? All of those things. It's just, just don't hurt others, right? Do what you feel is right for yourself. The Libertarian Party has been pro, pro um, you know, cannabis for 50 years, pro gay and trans rights, 50 years. I'm not even joking. I mean, for years, we, we were way ahead of Democrats on this one, not even close, way ahead. And we still are 100%. So I have to ask in reference to education. So I, I've worked in higher ed for over 10 years. So say it that way for over 10 years. And I, I have seen the cost of tui tuition yep. just greatly increase. Um, there's no stopping that. There seems to be no accountability for the colleges yep. to hold them back really? on that. And I know recently, you know, Joe Biden has decided to cancel 10 to $20,000 of yep. student loan debt for people who fit a certain income. Um, I said that he should have canceled all of it, but I think he's not going to do that because that would take away from recruitment for the military industrial complex. That's one of the benefits, one of the perks that you get if you join the military. I Free was college. a Marine for many years. I agree. Yep. I got my GI Bill. I know. Yeah. So I want to get your take on education in reference to higher ed and K through 12. What do you feel needs to change uh, in New York in, in specifically? A lot. And let, I'll, I'll touch the higher ed piece, which is more um, which is more national, and then I'll also cover New York State specifically. When it comes to higher ed, you can fix this problem too, right? I'm not against helping people who were in trouble at all, but you have two other problems. One, you have the you have the idea that some people are going to say, "Wait a minute, I did the right thing." So you've got to make the, you have to somehow appease the people who are going to fight you on. Wait a minute, I paid mine off. Why is someone else getting it? And there's millions of Americans who feel that way. So you should do something for them if you're going to help out the others. This should be something for them. Second, I don't want to be here ten years from now with the same problem. So I've got to fix the problem too. So three parts. So if you want to help out people, awesome, help them out, no problem, not against that. But second, I think the colleges who have taken such a massive advantage with these government-backed loans without having have any accountability, they've got to give something back. And my point is maybe you give back a year of college to everyone who you know paid back their loans. Now you might go, Larry, I'm not going back to school. I've been, no worries, it's transferable. You can give it to your kid, give it to your friend, sell it if you want to. But the college got to give something back. They have scammed for decades on this and they got to give something back. Now that at least allows the people who did the right thing in their mind to get something back. And it doesn't punish you or I. So help the people out and give people something for what they did. But the last piece, there's a model that works already. And the model is, believe it or not, the car industry. Yes, I know I'm a libertarian. Larry's using business. Yes, what did you expect? <laughs> I'm a libertarian. Do you expect something else? So of course, the car industry, right? If you, if you are uh, my age or older and you bought a car when you were younger, you remember that you didn't buy, you didn't finance the car through the car. You, the car company, you financed it through a bank. You went to a bank, got a loan, and then bought the car. Now, if you go buy a Ford or a Honda, whatever, you go to the Honda or the Ford finance company. So that company acts as a finance company, which is simply allow all these colleges to finance their own education. Done. Most of these, co these, these colleges have massive endowments anyway. They have tons of money. They use that to back the loans. What does that mean? Well, guess what? If you're backing the loan and I give you a crappy degree or I don't help you, you don't get a job, you're not getting your money back that now aligns the college's goals with yours. And if you're, if the degree you're getting is usually not gonna get you a very good job, then they'll have to lower the price because you won't be able to afford to pay it back. If the job is, if the degree is very high, they'll, it, they'll raise the price because it's, you're gonna get a good job or whatever. They, they have to give you a good degree. Right now, colleges have no reason to give you a good degree. Why? There's no punishment for it if they screw up. If they give you a piece of paper that sucks and you're, and you're stuck being a barista and here where I live in New York, 
I don't know how many baristas I've met who have college degrees, if not master's degrees, and they are baristas, yeah. and they're struggling to pay back their loans. So I don't want this to happen 10 years from now. Make them do this and support their own product, and they will have to give you a better product. So I'm okay with it as long as those three things exist. Why not just make the public universities free? You could if you want to, but then what's their incentive to give you good education? Well, no, I'd, I'd, I'd push back on that because the city, the city University of New York mm -hmm. at one point was free. It was. So we've done this before in this country. Sure. I think colleges, they just, they're operating like a business. They just want to make a lot of money and they realize this is something they can make a lot of money off of. But I would argue that just because college is free doesn't mean mm -hmm. you're getting less of an education because look at a country like Germany. They have yep. some of the best engineers in the world. So mm -hmm. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think community college and public colleges should be free. You could do that. But again, now who's paying for it? If you're going to tell me that you would use a system that I talked about earlier to where many companies, countries who have that, again, I'll bring up Norway. Norway is an example. There are many, many countries that use massive funds to pay for this, right? So if you're going to use funds from a trust to pay for this, I'm not against it. I'm with you. As I said, this trust can pay for education. If you wanted to add that education into, say, state colleges or city colleges, I'm in. I would do it. I don't have a problem with it at all. But I was talking about over the course of the entire country, right? For New York State, if you were saying the city universities and the state SUNY and CUNY that we pay for it that way, make it free, I'm not against that. I'm not against that. My issue is in New York State, if I if I then add more of a tax burden to my people, they are going to pack up and leave. They're leaving in droves up to half a million a year. So if we could do it that way, eh, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. But yeah, well, second... something, something ahead, I've please. noticed when it comes to, you know, helping out the people in this mm -hmm. country, nobody asked how we're going to pay for these wars. No one Libertarians asked, asked money... oh, no, 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 please. No, that's not fair. <laughs> Libertarians ask that all the time. <laughs> all the time That's, you're right you're right that's a good point but okay. I mean, billions and billions of dollars going to ukraine but we can't ask for free college and free community college i agree yeah i'm not gonna fight you on either we have libertarians are always talking about stop going to war stop killing people stop sending our troops overseas stop giving money to ukraine yes so when it comes to libertarians that on that case you are incorrect we have been yelling about this all day long you should not be sending these money over to ukraine we shouldn't be fighting wars 100 we should not be doing this and, and we don't want to bail out banks i'm not about bailing out banks you will never hear you will never hear libertarians say bail out banks bail out this i've been in the public eye in a major or minor way depending on whether i was running or not for the past five years you will never once hear me go oh i can't wait to bail out banks or fight war never happened once not a thing so I agree with you, right? And, and this makes libertarians angry when I say it. When I tell libertarians, look, I know many libertarians don't like socialists. I get that. That's a, com we, a common fight. And they go, well, we're going to give us money away. And I say, they have a point. We have money for all this other garbage. So why don't we have money for them? It's a valid point. I agree with you. I'd like to fix it to where we take our money that we make for the wealthy, give it to the people in our country who require help, and stop throwing money overseas. I'm with you. All right, cool. <laughs> yes. So let me now go to what I think is a big change in education here. One of the reasons why we have problems in education is because our education system is an industrial, an industrial education, industrial era education system. It is absolutely the wrong system, right? Absolutely. We should not be doing K through 12 at all. We should be doing K through 10, actually pre K through 10. Pre-K through 10th is what we should be doing. We should be paying for pre-K through 10th grade off the bat. That should be the norm. Once you get to 10th grade, you want to start thinking about what are you going to do with your life? Not waiting until you go to college and graduate at 22 and start thinking about what you do with your life. We're going to start thinking early. Why do you want to start thinking early? Well, Larry, people make mistakes. Absolutely. But making a mistake, a price for failure at 16 is nothing compared to the price for failure at 26. So I want to start getting kids thinking about their future at 16, earlier on, thinking about trade schools, thinking about, you know, uh, specialized schools, thinking about prep schools, advanced degrees, thinking about that at 10th grade. It's a whole different way of looking at it. And if you like Europe, that's what Europe does. You've been telling me about Germany, about all those countries do K through 10, right? They're not going to 12th grade. 
I mean, they are, but their 12 is very different than us. Our problem is our money, most of the, the money that comes in in New York State, a big chunk of it, comes either from localized taxes and or federal and state grants. When you have federalized and state grants, they incentivize the schools only by their graduation rate going into college, their placement rates into college. This is unnecessary. It should be whether the kids and the parents are satisfied with schooling. College is not for everybody. I'm not against college. I'm against us pushing people into college. That's not the right answer, right? And I hear that people will say, but Larry, college is the way to success. It's a way to success. And more and more, less the only way. There are a lot of people who are making a lot of money now not going to college. It's common. There are ways you can do that. Or go to college later in life. I went to college when I was 21. I wasn't ready when I was 17. I was a, I was a punk. I didn't want to go at 17. Mm -hmm. I joined the Marine Corps at 17, right? I, I became a better person, a better man, and I went when I was 21, which was better. But why can't you be pushing people into trade schools if they want to go there? You can't find that in my state. I, don't, I can't talk about the states. I can talk from my state. You can't find You're going to struggle to find a guidance counselor who says, hey, why don't you go to our, our trade school, our BOCES? No. They're going to say, don't go to those. That's for the dumb kids. That's yeah. for the bad kids. All the time in my state. So now kids are getting forced into go, not forced, pressured is a better way of saying it. Pressure into going to colleges that they don't want to go to. And they shouldn't go to. We see with our veterans coming out of, out of uh, the military. They come out of the military and they go to school because someone told them to go to school. If you wanted to go to school, you wouldn't have gone to military, you would have gone to college. A lot of these guys didn't want to go to college. I was one of them. So we have to change the system to where now we're focusing on kids being happy. And my plan is at once you hit 10th grade, if you pass a test, you have a high school diploma. Once you have a high school diploma, the state will provide you with a credit of $20,000 you have five years to use it. Very similar to a GI Bill, similar style. You can go to any two-year school you want to. You want to go to a two-year trade school, a two-year prep school. Right? You say you know you want to go into engineering or you know you want to be a doctor. Go to a prep school for that so you're ready to go in. The average kid now across America, it takes six years to graduate college. The average kid, if they even graduate. Why? For most kids, the last year of high school is almost a waste. It's basically just smoking weed and playing video games and study uh -huh. hall and stuff like that. For too many kids, there are some who aren't, but for too many, it's that. Why do you think they're so eager to jump into the military? And they're so eager to just, oh, I'm going to college now. And for many kids, college, the first year of college is 13th grade because they're not ready. Instead, give them a couple years to get ready, do the right thing, do any other thing you want to do. You want to you go to trade school, prep school. Say you're that really smart kid who you know you're going to get a doctorate. Great. Go, to, go get an associate's degree at 16. Go do it. You have one when you're 18. Or go to trade school and get a job when you're 18. You can be 24 years old and have a degree that you don't like and be working at Starbucks with $100,000 of debt. Or you can be 24, be a plumber, no debt, and be making at least 70 k a year, if not 100. Do what you need to do. That's my point. You asked what I thought about education. That's what I think about education. That's interesting. I think that another thing that we need to look at too is the fact that some of these programs that I, I felt really were beneficial to students at an early age were removed from the public school system. Yeah. Wood shop. Yeah. Uh, that's a big one. 100%. People don't know how to build. They don't know how to make things with their hands anymore. Uh, some schools used to have like automotive classes. My dad told me about this when he was in school. Mm -hmm. Those things have been taken away. The, a lot of the music and arts yep. have been taken away from the schools as well. So it's almost just like you're pretty much you're kind of like like trained to remember all of this, memorize all of this stuff so that mm -hmm. you can go to college. And this is again, your audience is already I know mad at me. It's fine. I still love you guys, even if you're mad at me. <laughs> um, uh, they're going to be mad at me again when I say this. The reason is federal government. Why? Every school in New York State and I, I assume your state, too, I assume is without question um, being being judged by the federal government with standardized testing. That's how they get paid. That's how they get those, those federal grants. So what does that mean? That means that the, the teachers are pressured into doing two things, ELA and math. They don't get woodshop. Why? That's not in the test. They don't get home ec. That's not in the test. They don't know how to do basic contract work, which I say but in high school, you should be doing basic, con we all click that, you know, uh, I accept the terms. And we don't know basic contract law. That should be taught in high school. Basic contract law, how interest works, rent versus versus buying. That should be taught in high school. None of that's there. That's not a test. 
right? So shop isn't there. Uh, civics isn't there anymore in most schools, right? Of course. Now let's go to private schools. Private schools have all that stuff. Again, the wealthy are set. They don't care about this stuff. What do they care? Their kids all go to private school. They get whatever they want because they're writing checks. I'm talking about ways to actually fix things, give a chance for the average kid to have a better chance. Mm, I think, yeah, I, I could talk about education all night. <laughs> I could talk about education all night. No, no, but your, I think your audience wants you to yell at me. Feel free to yell at me. I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind. I don't I think mind. That, um, one of the issues that's been coming up a lot, especially with this crisis with Russia and Ukraine, mm -hmm. is uh, war. And the yes. United States government spending so much money on the military industrial complex instead of using that money in other places. And I want to get your 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 opinion about that, because it looks like now I saw earlier today on Twitter, they're already talking about sending arms to Taiwan. Yep. Uh, look, again, there's everything you've heard me talk about was about trying my best to do what I think is best, which obviously your audience disagrees. But still, uh, I hope that when your audience is mad at me, they at least know that I am I am arguing in good faith, that I do believe that my views are correct. I'm not just trying to troll you guys. But in any <laughs> case, um, in any case, uh, always, I'm, I'm never gonna say I think the right answer is taking the money that we all you know work hard for and, and in some cases just print, when the Fed prints it, and give it to others. No, of course I want to keep it within within our country and help the the people in America who need it. No, look, I grew up in the South Bronx. My mom was an addict. My mom's a felon or was a felon. She passed away. My mom was a felon. I understand what it's like to be poor. I understand what it's like to not have what you want. I get it. I understand what it's like to be to to have your life you know trashed because of of the government. I get that completely. So what I'm trying to do is create a world where I think it will work better. What I noticed. When I was, when I came back from the Marine Corps, I pulled my mother out of jail. She had only two garbage bags. So she had left from everything she had built. My mom was also an immigrant, which is even worse. So she came out and I used my savings that I had in the Marine Corps and I got her an apartment and a car and we tried to get her a job. How hard she worked to get a job. And if anyone, if you've ever had a felon in your life, I don't know if you ever have, but if you have a felon in your life, you realize how they have to lie on their, on their, um, on, on their resume and lie on everything to try to hope that... It, and my mom was a hostage because once she got a job, she couldn't say anything. She got fired. There's no job for her out there, right? She gets fired. And if they do a background check, she is fired. So what, what do I do? Well, instead, I said, you know what? I'm going to start a business. And the reason why I started a business, and my mom had remarried at the time. So I had a stepfather. And I said, we're going to start a business. And in this business, my mom is going to be 100% owner. And he was like, what? What about you and me? Nope. She's 100% owner or I'm not in. And they were like, why? I said, because my mom's 100% owner. No one can ever fire her. She is no longer a hostage. She's now her own person. And that was my push in entrepreneurship. And since then, I've seen that the ownership mindset is everything. And ownership mindset is everything. If people begin to have ownership mindset, they will move further. It's not a, it's not a magical pill. It doesn't fix everything. People still need services. People still fall down, right? But what I saw with my mom is the systems the government had to help her were not helping. She was going right back into the same thing. My father, believe it, that's gonna sound crazy. My father was a corrections officer at Rikers Island. So I've seen both sides of this, right? There's a magic pill for people who have been convicted uh, of, of a felony to get them back in action. It's five years of work. When someone who's a felon has five years of work, the odds of them going back to jail are less than someone who's never been a felon. That's magic. My goal is to make that better, not to have some, some government program. Instead, you know what I want to do in New York State? If you are a small business or any business, but big business will never do this. So I'll say any business. If you're a business in New York State and you hire a felon, for every felon you hire, you do not have to pay any payroll tax on that felon for two years. If over 50% of your employees are felons, you pay no state income tax for two years. And someone, someone always tell me, wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute then they'll just hire these felons to use and fire them. Good, you're, you're training my felon population and you're giving them a resume so they can get back in action. I'm okay with that. And they go, Larry, that sounds crazy. Everything we've tried since then has failed. Since the war on drugs in the 1970s, everything else has failed. So maybe my idea is wrong. Maybe it is. But can it be any worse than everything else we've tried? It's been nothing but failure. I still see it. And I see my veteran population more than anything else. I see them collapsing everywhere. We can help them too. The government programs aren't working.
I have a better answer. How do you feel about in reference to the criminal justice system? Because one of the problems that we have with our system, at least in this country, mm -hmm. there really isn't rehabilitation. Correct. Not the Agreed. way that it, it should be. I don't know. Some yeah. people will chime in and say, well, they, you can take class when you're in jail and you can read books. Yeah, but that, eh, that's not really rehabilitation. Correct. And that's something that I, I, I do wish would change that there would actually be real rehabilitation. I think they need to look at some of the other models that are happening in countries like Norway, what yep. they're actually doing, how they actually rehabilitate uh, the prisoners. But in, in reference to incarceration, one of the things that's come up before is that there are people who are in prison because they have committed a crime. And then you have people that are in jail, not necessarily because they committed a crime, but because they can't afford cash bail. Correct, agreed. I don't want to, I want to get your opinion about that. What do you think should happen with the bail system? Let me touch two of those pieces. One is in Massachusetts, you have a good one. You have a plan. I believe it's called the Humvee program. Mm -hmm. And the Humvee program is basically if, if I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to generalize. It's basically you have a unit of people who are of the same type, in this case, veterans. So you then take the, the veterans who've been arrested. And those who seem to be working well on their way out, they go ship into the Humvee program, which is run by volunteers and some corrections officers, but mostly volunteers. And then it becomes almost like a halfway house. And the recidivism, recidiv the recidivism rate, I think, in Massachusetts is something like 80% or something like that. But for this, it's less than 10. Massive change. So I want to follow that. I call them CPUs, which is community, um, um, I'm sorry, CRUs. Community, um, um, hold on, CRU. I always call their crew. I've actually forgotten what the middle is. Uh, yeah, so anyways, we have to tell you, there we go. Community rehabilitation units, which is a similar issue than Humvee. I'm following the Humvee program that works in Massachusetts, right? So now we can have it. Say it's all, I'm making this up, working moms, or maybe it's certain addicts, or maybe it's veterans, or maybe it's of a certain gender, or maybe it's of a certain um, ethnic background. Whatever I think will work, I'm open to any of these options. And you create these areas. And whenever someone has a problem, addiction, mental health, they fall down. The person who's gonna help them most is someone who's been through it before. So I want a volunteer core of people to come in. I want the nonprofit sections to work alongside the corrections officers. Corrections officers know how to control people, usually men, because the vast majority of prisoners are men. So they know how to control men, that's it. That's what they know, control men. So great, bring in the, the nonprofits who know how to rehabilitate people. So now we have them together. And then they can start to rehabilitate people and get them out and make that recidivism rate go down. If we do that, we can change it. I completely agree with you, we should change it. When it comes to bail reform, bail reform is a wonderful idea. It just was not implemented well in New York State. And there are two reasons why it was implemented well. Number one, it was during COVID when we decided to do it. So because mm -hmm. it was during COVID, everybody just threw everybody back out because they were afraid of COVID. But, wow, bad timing. That was just unlucky right there. It made everything bad. So the timing was just bad. The second thing is we didn't focus it on something else, which is first time offenders. We really should be focusing bail reform on first time offenders. That should be the focus of it. There, if, if you've been arrested six times in a week, you probably shouldn't be out on bail whether you're poor or not. It should be irrelevant, right? You, if you're out, if you've if been arrested six times in one week, the odds are, don't get me wrong, there will be somebody who is, you know, shouldn't be in jail, don't get me wrong. But the idea is to be, it should be focused on first time offenders. Bail reform as a real thing, it should be done it was not done well at all. And the judges, sadly, in my state made things worse because the judges in my state, they were against bail reform. They actually wanted to keep all the power with them. So they actually made sure it failed. The judges in my state made it worse than anything else. But you're correct. Bail reform is a good idea. There are lots of issues we should be fixing. I'm on board with bail reform. I am. Well, I think when we look at, I would say when we look at most crime, most mm -hmm. crime is poverty driven. And this or is the systemic. point I always, or, yeah, or, it's, or, and systemic. There's there's systemic there, but there's also poverty. I mean, yep, you know, it, people are talking about the crime rate has increased in New York. They're like, yep. people are it crime is crazy here now. And I'm like, mm, people are des there's desperation. There's Agreed. a lot of despair. And so my question is, is why are why aren't people focusing on how to fix the poverty situation? For example, Mississippi has jumped on board with this. I was surprised it was Mississippi, but they've jumped on board with this and they decided, you know how we're going to like fix the homeless problem? We're going to build more homes for them, specifically 100%. for them. 
And I would like to see more states like get on board with this. And New York City, I, I lived in New York uh, many years ago. It was expensive then, it's expensive now. It's almost, it's very difficult to make it there financially if you don't already have some type of help, I would say. And you're right. A lot of people are leaving New York. That's been going on for years. 100%. I've seen people like leave. And it's just it's just too expensive. It's it's happening here in Boston too. Yep. People are being pushed out because of gentrification. These neighborhoods don't look the same anymore. The last time I was in Brooklyn, I was like, what is this? What happened to Brooklyn? So it's just at some point, when is anyone just going to put a stop to it and stop selling properties to these investors and yep. pushing poor black people out of these neighborhoods? When yep. is someone going to put a stop to that? Because where else are people supposed to go? I agree. Everything you've said, I agree with 100%. I think there are several answers. I wish it was just one answer. It isn't. I'm going to give you a couple of them. I hope I don't drive your, your chat too crazy. But I will give you a couple of answers. And at least the one thing you'll hear me say, and I hope your audience will respect this, is at no point did I go into theory. At no point did I just blame the other party. I didn't do any of that. I actually gave you answers, even though... You guys clearly did not like them. But at least I gave you answers. I did not hide and I gave you answers. And I will give you answers for this too. The first piece is you are totally correct. We have a big problem in, in most cities, but New York City is bigger. And there are several pieces that you want to handle on this. It's not a simple answer. Piece number one is public housing. Public housing is a disaster in New York City. I mean, it's, a, it's an embarrassment. We should be ashamed. And people say it's underfunded. It's not underfunded. It's terribly managed. And there are several ways we can fix this. Number one, we should be allowing people in public housing if they want to, to own the home. And we don't do that. Why aren't we creating a rent to own situation within public housing? We should do that. That would be a great idea. Now, some people don't want to own. I'm okay with that, but there are many who would want to. What happens? They start owning. When you own a home, two things happen. Number one, other people want to help you because you're a home owner, number one. But number two, now you have an asset. When wealthy people leave, right? When they leave their home, they get a check because they always have some kind of equity in their home. So when wealthy people leave their home and move, they get a check. When not wealthy people move, they might get one half of one month's rent back, maybe, if they're lucky. Often they don't. What do wealthy people have that non wealthy people don't have? That is equity. Let's start giving people equity in public housing. I'm not joking. I think it's a great idea. They've done that before in Singapore and in London. Again, this is a monetary work, and it worked well. It was better. It's not a be-all, end-all, but that's the first step. So now people, if they want to, can start renting to own. Don't change the rent. The rent's the same. Start doing that. But something else, encourage the people, the big, the big business. Your point's very valid. Permanent capital is buying up all of the real estate and crushing people. Totally correct. Three ways we deal with that. Number one, give them something else to invest in. That is my idea of the New York State Social Trust. That's piece one. Isn't enough, but that's one piece. Second piece, allow them a benefit to their end taxes if they do rent to own. So now you can have literally these companies create rent to own properties that will get more people buying. But at the end, instead of paying massive um, taxes in New York State, you give them a huge tax break if they allow rent to own. Why? Because they'll actually make less money up the front end, but they'll make more at the back end. They'll still make their money because they're going to make their money. I know some of you are going to say, don't let them make money. Profit's bad. That's a fantasy. They're going to make their money. So I'm saying let's make their money in the back end, help out people to have ownership and have some actual assets up front. You do that, you'll have more of them doing that instead. So now you get more people to do that. That will help also. But I'll add on top of that, when it comes to the homelessness, homelessness is not a monolith, right? There are many types of people who are homeless. There are working poor who are homeless, mentally ill who are homeless, people who have addiction problems who are homeless. It's not a monolith. Right, so we've got to be able to fix that issue and touch each of them separately. When it comes to shelters, as a general rule, people who are working poor are able to get around and deal with all the issues required, all the paperwork to get into the shelters. But people who aren't working poor, people who have addiction problems or mental health problems, they can't do it. We're asking too much of them. They can't. So instead, allow nonprofits more leeway in creating tiny housing, more leeway in building houses. We have a couple of them right now in New York. Jericho Project is one of them. And they have it to where, again, they are community-based, meaning either people who are, say, all from the same or all from a, a same you know, community, whatever that is. And so say it's working moms or single moms, as an example, as one community. Well, they have tiny houses up top. And then bottom, they have community areas. 
And then the bottom, they're going to have people like, uh, you know, healthcare, childcare, stuff like that to help them out. And what happens is the person agrees only one thing, to pay one third of their income. If your income is nothing, you pay nothing. Income's 100 bucks, 33 bucks. One third of your income is, is the deal to be in this place. What does that mean? You're never kicked out. So you leave when you're ready to leave. Hopefully you make a bunch of money and you're successful and you're happy and you say, you know what? I'm, I'm making too much money to be in this place and I go someplace else. But what we found actually happens in these cases is people stay and they become mentors for others because they believe in their love in the community. And it allows mentors to help people who've been through the thing, addiction, veterans, whatever the case may be. You begin to do those things, things will become better, right? You can fix this problem, but people have to be able to, people have to, be able to build tiny home, homes People who've been homeless for many years often don't even want to leave the street. It becomes a life for them. They actually don't trust going to shelters. They don't trust this. You got to give them a tiny home. If you give them a larger home, they will literally make themselves a, a home within that home in one room. So give them tiny homes. In most cities, it's against the law. Change those laws to allow tiny homes, build more, incentivize the heavy hitters to do something else, and to invent and rent to own make rent to own more common and over the course of several years sadly i wish i could solve it tomorrow you will find more people fixing this if you just build more housing that's all you do you will still have a problem with the mentally ill and the and the addicts they're not going to go so it, it can't only be that it must be that and other things to get them in that's the issue the last piece i bring up is specifically new york city this is the idea of what i call the caring caboose the caring caboose is Many people who don't go to shelters wind up going to the MTA, right? our subway system, our bus system is yeah. a common thing. So let's meet them where they are. The back car of every other train is literally a carrying caboose. It is a caboose that is sponsored by some company that wants to look good. I don't care. Some pharma company. I don't care. Give me the money so I can help the people. I don't care what, you want, what your goal is. They do it. No cops because many of the uh, of people who are homeless are afraid of cops and addicts are too. Mm -hmm. So it's private security. They'll go there and there are people that get Wi-Fi who can help them out. Oh, it's Johnny. You, Johnny, are you on your meds? Are you having a problem? I do this. Hey, Johnny, let me help you get into the system that you have fallen out of. So now I can get you into that tiny home. I can get you into that, that shelter. I can get you into the place that you can't get on your own because you don't have the facility to do it because you either you have mental illness issues or you have addiction issues. Now that actually then meets them where they are. Now I gave you a lot. I know I did, but this is a serious problem. And there is no, just build more houses. That's not going to work. It's not a monolith. There are lots of people with different issues. You've got to make many things happen. You've got to deal with the, the bigger boys too. I know that uh, Massachusetts, uh, some of the public housing uh, communities here, they've made promises to those residents that they could rent and then, and then eventually own their apartment. Yep. Um, in fact, I've, I've talked to some of the tenants and it wasn't true. Right. It was just another thing that they told them. And it's really upsetting because like the city doesn't, they don't really get involved. Like Boston Housing Authority is like, we yep. can't really step foot on it because it's public housing. And it's just, they just get over people, get over on them. And it's it's really uh, sad, but- I, I agree wanna... completely, which is why you want to have an executive, a governor or a mayor who is 100% on board, who's saying, no, you will do this. If you don't do it, I'm I'm hitting you personally, right? And this is a, a piece that I bring up, which most people don't understand this is very libertarian. And this is the idea of, of a unit that finds victims. What I mean by that. I usually wanna, we usually wanna come to the environment, environmental issues, right? I wanna create an environmental victims unit. Most departments of, of, of preservation or of conservation or whatever the case may be, don't know how to prosecute people and break the corporate veil and get the individuals who made the decisions. Very rare, almost never happens. Imagine if you actually had a unit that that's what their job was. Their job was, I'm going to actually find the right people and I'm going to put up a, an actual case and I'm going to give it to the AG to prosecute an executive who made a decision that hurt people. That almost never happens. Imagine that happened. That is actual libertarian. It is an individual taking responsibility for their poor decisions on hurting other people. There's a victim. Punish them. Instead, what do we do? We go, big company is bad. We'll fine them $10 million when they made $80 billion on the deal they did. They don't care. It's part of the cost doing business. But now you come after the individual, things change. You should do that in many cases to include people who are scamming people when they're supposed to rent to own and, and don't do it. Punish the individual made the decision. I thought I'm going to screw them. Great. You going to jail or you're paying out of your pocket. Either one. I'm okay.
All right. So Larry, um, when can you remind everyone? Cause we did have people come in later. Can you remind them when is your, uh, lawsuit? When are you going to court again? I am going to court September 9th and I'm hoping okay. that I'll be able to get a ballot. If I get on the ballot, then there will be third parties in New York state. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. But more importantly that most people don't get, I know that a lot of your audience is unhappy with my ideas. I get it, but here's what I'm telling you. If I'm in the debate stage, both the Democrat and Republican will have to answer my questions. They will have to come up with actual plans. You might go, yeah, if you lean right or lean left, and most of your audience leans left. If you lean left, you're gonna say, Democrats are gonna solve you. Lean right, Republicans are gonna solve it. No, they're not. Democrats have run my state for 20 years. It is not being got, it is not getting better. Republicans have watched them for 20 years and they have no plans. So you might think they're gonna do better. They're not in my state. Maybe your states run better than mine, perhaps. Mine is not being run well. Um, and Democrats are not doing their job, and Republicans have no answers. They're they're not even I don't I guess they're a party in theory, but not not in my state. They don't do anything. So unless someone is there to hold them accountable, nobody will hold them accountable. Well said. Well, Larry, you know, we don't agree on everything, but mm -hmm. like, like I said, like I want people to hear different voices and to hear how people think about these issues as well. Uh, where can people find you on uh, socials? Mm -hmm. I hope that we at least agree on our desired outcome. I hope that's true. I hope we agree that we want the people who need help to get more help, that we right. want people to have better health care, that we want people to have better education. I get that we don't agree on how to get there. I get that. But I hope we we do agree on the outcome that we want. That's the outcome that I want. I do want that outcome. And I think that my answer is a bit, obviously I believe my answer is a better answer. I wouldn't be saying it. So if you want to see what I'm doing, it's LarrySharp.com or go to Larry Sharp on all of the things. I'm on everything from Twitter to TikTok to YouTube to everything. It's Larry Sharp and it's Larry Sharp with an E and the E stands for um, encouraging. I like that. <laughs> all right, Larry, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Bye. Okay, guys, I told you guys, you need to hear from different people. We need to have different voices on this show, even if we don't agree on all of the issues. I